Dennis Ferrer. I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies. And today I will explain to you the history, objectives, successes and stumbles of the EU structural investment funds. Uh, I will then also conclude with a short description of the changes and challenges for the next programming period from 2021 to 2027. I now introduce to you European Structural Investment Funds, the ESI Funds. The European Structural Investment Funds, the ESI Funds, is the present correct term for what we still refer to as structural funds. These are not synonymous terms. The ESI Funds are a combination of different funds targeting regions. We have now all been put, put under one regulatory framework to ensure coherence and a better coordination and to avoid overlaps. These are really divided into uh, first the structural funds, uh, which were developed to support regions and include the oldest ones, that is the European Social Fund, was created in the Treaty of Rome to tackle the lingering poverty and unemployment in the post-war eras. It was meant to address the social challenges in the European countries, coupled with industrial decline and restructuring. Then we have the European Regional Development Funds, which has been active since 1975 for the poorest areas in the European Economic Community at the time. Uh, it was created to tackle infrastructural challenges and to stop the decline of certain regions and help the restructuring of their economies. The main initial beneficiaries were Italy and then followed by the United Kingdom. The Cohesion Funds, which has been established in 1994 with the entry of Spain and Portugal, was, to address, was created to address infrastructural weaknesses at cross-national level, across regions. Uh, beneficiary member states are those with a GDP per capita at national level below 90% of the EU average. So it was really created to address transnational transport, energy and telecommunication infrastructures, which are crucial for a country to develop and also to allow poorer regions the access to national EU central markets. The European Maritime and, uh, and Fisheries Funds uh, and the European Agriculture Fund for Rural Development are also now part of uh, the ESI funds and these address sectoral, structural and competitiveness problems in these areas. And these are not regionally pre-allocated, this is by problem areas. These were added to the ESI funds uh, to respond really to the need of coordination in some areas uh, where they overlap with other funds. What is the position of the ESI funds within the EU budget? For the seven-year multi-annual financial framework for 2014-2020, the budget was about 1 trillion euro or just over 140 billion a year on average. The EU budget in total is 1% of member state GDP or just 2% of the overall public expenditure. 34% of the EU budget is dedicated to economic, social and territorial cohesion, cohesion which involves the five ESI funds. These five funds are managed by member states under shared management, which means that they manage them and report to the European Commission, which is ultimately the body responsible for the overall use of the EU budget and is accountable to the European Parliament. Thus, the national authorities have been delegated the managing of the funds, but under the supervision of the European Commission, hence shared management. These funds are, however, not the only funds intervening in the economic and social development of regions and countries. These funds are, however, not the only funds intervening in the economic and social development of regions and countries. There are the funds that are not under shared management that the EU provides. These are under the Competitiveness for Growth and Jobs headings, coordinated, funded and managed directly by the European Commission. The target areas are similar, but the objectives are not local, but pan-European. If you look at the SE funds, we have some research and innovation in the structural funds, but it's focused on capacity building. At EU level, we have the Horizon 2020 program, based on excellence and financing projects, not the capital cost of buildings or cost of human capital development, which, however, in fact, could be covered by ESI funds in eligible regions. Here is possible to see the synergies between these, those funds. ESI funds can support, with the research and innovation investments, the building of capacity to participate at the European level in Horizon 2020 projects. But this happens also with other funds. Information and communication technology, energy grids and transport at regional level can be supported by the connections that are financed by the cohesion funds at national level, which then in turn can be connected to cross-border projects in the Connectum Euro facility to the rest of Europe. There are thus complementary links between the shared and centrally managed funds. The competitiveness for growth and jobs 
uh, programs are driven by wider EU objectives. For example, strengthening EU research and innovation, improving cross-border operation, and strengthening the single market, or supporting lending where needed for SMEs. It is run at the European level. It is therefore not part of regional policy, even if regional actors can apply, can apply for those funds. The following slide is meant to give a feeling how the EU budget compares or relates to other parts of the European Union finances. There are in fact many more financial areas in the EU. The EU budget can be seen in the blue circle and it is just one element of many. Well, very often it is presented as the only financial tool. The green circle is what the EU's institutional system is managing. It means the European Parliament, the Court of Elders and the European Commission. In the dark blue circle you have the EU budget and within the green circle, you have what the member states guarantee through the budget. There are a number of funds that are guaranteed by the EU budget, such as the financial instruments to leverage private finance in the ESI funds, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, or Juncker Plan, that offers guarantees and equity to the European Investment Bank and other banks to finance projects and attract other investors. We have the balance of payments, which supports countries that are not in the Eurozone when they face the crisis, and the European Financial Stabilization me Mechanism that does this to support Eurozone countries. The yellow bubbles are separate national contributions to support the EU programs under European Commission control, the European Development Funds and the Specialized Trust Funds. Beyond uh, all of these funds that are controlled by, the, by the, uh, these institutions, there are those that have been created by the European Council, this means intergovernmentally by the member states as governments, that agree jointly to manage outside the institutional setting certain areas. Also outside the green circle we have the EAB group, which is also a particular uh, body because it's part of the European institutions, but it's independent from the European Commission. Some of the operations are fully under EU budgetary control because they are guaranteed by the EU budget, but the main operations are not guaranteed by the EU budget. The EAB has a 500 billion euro portfolio of projects and lends approximately 70 billion a year. In addition, much of this that has been covered is co-financed by member states and economic operators and uh, the EU budget and all the banks financing the financial instruments, FC and so on. So creating a lot of leverage for EU objectives. So the size and influence of the EU uh, funds, of the EU budget and funds on the EIB is much higher than what is commonly believed. Then uh, we have other areas, finance, through the European Council Intergovernmental Tools, as mentioned before, which is, for example, there is recently set up European Financial Stabilization Mechanism that will transform the European Stabilization Mechanism, ESM, uh, which is backing with hundreds of billions of support mechanism to act in case of an economic crisis. It's a kind of guarantee by the member states. Also, the European Central Bank is a big uh, operator. And finally, we have also the Green Loan Facility, was created to save Greece. Let's see now the eligibility for, of the regions for the structural funds. Uh, in terms of how much support you receive and the intensity of support. There are three categories of, uh, of regions. The less developed regions or convergent regions. These are the ones that have a GDP per head under the 75% of the EU27 average with the highest intensity of support, the EU budget. Then you have the transition regions and GDP per head between 75 to 95 percent of the average, uh, where some regions may be improving, others are declining. So there we, we have this transitional uh, branch. And then we have the most developed regions, which have a GDP per head higher than 90 percent of the EU average. So you also get support for very specific issues. Note that this image comes from the European Commission, it's ahead of Brexit. I mentioned the EU27, but the UK is still part of the EU at the moment of this presentation and part of the picture. I don't know why. Anyway, the EU co-finances projects, but does not finance operational costs such as the maintenance, such as maintenance. It is important to be aware of this fact and regions to take into consideration the operational cost and what they build, avoid prestige projects that sit in large infrastructure with large operational costs that are then underutilized. This has been a cause for a lot of the troubles the EU budget has been going through. The EU can finance and upgrade 
uh, upgrades and replacements, but not repairs, not maintenance or running costs. The co-financing in the sense of the funds, how much the EU can give really varies very much between the kind of interventions. The highest limit to support of the structural funds for a grant to the private sector would never go over 50%. But for, for public infrastructure, this co-finance by public funds, it has reached 85% in the poorest regions. Even exceptionally due to the crisis, some regions were granted 100% of EU finance. The co-financing rate up to the limit allowed by the regulations is decided by the regions, by all the member states. Uh, and this will decide if they want more projects with lower EU co-financing or less projects with higher EU co-finance. The most important thing is the decision is taken with an understanding how the public budget and the private sector can contribute so there is no oversubsidization by the EU when it is unnecessary to maximize the use of the funds. In the richer regions, funding is competitiveness oriented and only covers specific areas of EU priorities such as energy, employment or innovation. It does not have the large scope that it has in poorer regions. Well, in this slide we see uh, the eligibility of the cohesion funds, which is uh, the countries uh, that are at 90% of EU average level or lower. And uh, you have also some countries that are phasing out the uh, transition countries. Um, which is the case of Cyprus. But the cohesion fund gives support to countrywide infrastructure, large national infrastructure, and transport, energy, and telecoms. And some of it goes also to connect the, for the national part of trans European networks. So it supports the Connect Neuro facility and reduces, therefore, the need of funding at that uh, budget line, which is quite reduced. Here I will uh, discuss the, the logic of the strategic uh, weighting, the funds are implemented. Uh, the SE funds have to be in line with the overall European strategy. This is namely the European 20, Europe 2020 strategy at the moment, which is the brainchild of the Lisbon strategy that was created at the beginning of the century as a reaction to the need to compete with the rest of the world. Uh, countries have to prepare a common strategic framework where they describe their targets their, uh, and how they will achieve them. And the Commission and, uh, and the countries will have to sign this uh, in a partnership agreement. So the countries also have to follow the thematic objectives that the EU requires so that it's in line with EU objectives. The, then the, there are operational programs that are being, uh, have to be drafted to describe, describe the implementation, how they will achieve the goals, how much money is attributed to each action. And uh, the uh, programs, the overall programs can either be thematic or regional, depending uh, uh, how the country wants to choose it. And countries that are just small, they can also have a single program uh, the, mm, a national program or even single thematic programs. Uh, all of these programs have to be approved by the European Commission. This slide shows the SE funds allocation by member states. Poland is the main beneficiary, followed by Italy, Spain, Romania, Germany because of Eastern German, France, and Portugal. The location is really related to the level of development, but also very much by the size of the country. Uh, we can also see why Poland is so interested now in showing how effectively you can use the funds because given the dependency that they have on this and importance for their country. But it's also very important to understand that, that for some countries the share of the cohesion policy uh, programs with the and supported by the cohesion policy is very large in the level of investment of the country. You can see here a, a large dependency by many countries. Uh, and this is also including, of course, the national co-finance, but you can see how much the country's investment is really co based on the EU finance, which is of very high political importance for these countries. Now let me uh, introduce you to the method of the programming the funds, the strategic logic behind. Today, in the European Structural Investment Funds, the, the funds have to be in line with European strategies, with the overall strategy, so Europe, the Europe 2020 strategy, which is like the, the, the child of the Lisbon strategy, started in the, uh, in the beginning of the century when it was clear it was a need for the member states to, to invest more. Member states have to follow this and therefore the EU funding, which is the EU which is giving funding, also has to fund on the, European, uh, the Europe 2020 strategy. Countries have to prepare a common strategic framework where they describe what are the targets of their strategy, how they will achieve inside their national structure and the national uh, 
policies, European goals. So with the common strategic uh, framework done and with a description also of how they will implement it in the strategy, there is a partnership agreement with the European Commission. They commit themselves to, to do this and the Commission will commit itself to support it. And the, the, then the member states have to really also present uh, and align with the final agreement, the operational programs, which is operational programs are really the implementation programs, how they will wear and how much money for what exactly and what, what are the links, this also have to be approved. Now, this these operational programs uh, can be either thematic or regional, they can be even national, depending on small countries that they don't have regions, they, they would they would actually have uh, one uh, one program per, per sector, normally a sector thematic program. Uh, and in, in some regions that they have, they have just regional programs that cover several sectors. Um, so this depends on the on the multi-level governance and the structures of the country, how it's done. Now, what are the thematic objectives? What I mean the thematic objectives uh, that are very often mentioned? These are, are really objectives that regions are required to to focus on them and the policies to be coherent on these 11 thematic objectives. The regions and countries they can choose to uh, focus more in one or another and, and the weight is really a national decision but there has to be, this has to be covered. Uh, some of them are quite wide so it's not that much left out but we have a really a focus, we have to, you can see also the, the strategic order, strengthening research and technological development starts at the beginning, it's not building infrastructure, which is a, an old way uh, of, of using the funds. Now it's more really think about the, the development and the innovation and, and the rest to be built around it to a certain extent. Uh, enhancing access to, to information communication technologies. Um, then the competitiveness is an important point. Uh, not only in, in, in businesses and small and medium enterprises, that is one of the focus of those in the agricultural sector, fishery. So, uh, focus not only on, on the old uh, subsidy point, but try to reinforce it. This is structural changes to make it better. Um, then there are investments in the uh, in, in in low carbon uh, sectors and also in adaptation. These are uh, these are also fundings that are, are given for this. Uh, also for, for energy efficiency in buildings, for example, is also part of the structural funds. Um, you have environmental uh, programs, resource efficiency, uh, sustainable transport, uh, infrastructures, uh, uh, quality of employment and labor mobility. Uh, this is social inclusion is in there. We have, we have also the education, training and very important lifelong learning. Uh, programs that the EU supports with the structural funds. And then last but not least, the enhancing the institutional capacity of the public authorities to, to face the challenges of today being more efficient and also deal more efficiently with the funding too. But these objectives are very important because they're the backbone of the operational programs. It's the, the member states have to do the strategies based on, on this one. So just to give you an idea of, of how the the use refining its targeting and its funding. Uh, now, what is the, the allocation? We can see here the allocation by country. Uh, Poland is the main beneficiary now, followed by Italy, then Spain, then Romania, Germany, France, Portugal. So this is, of course, related between the level of development and the, the size. But here you have the, uh, the, uh, the allocation of the funding. You can see why for Poland it's, it's very important to prove the funding ha have used because for them it's important to to prove that it, it's worthwhile to financing them. Now here you have uh, a picture that's quite revealing that it shows the share of cohesion policy which includes the national co-financing so it's not the EU funding alone but how much funding goes into the objectives of structural fund, how much of it is linked to the strategies, how much is linked to this cohesion funding. You can see that uh, from the total investment in the countries the, the EU budget and, and, and the, the connection of it, the power of it to direct investment is enormous. In Slovakia, the estimation goes over 90% of all of the investment in the country has something to do with the cohesion policy funding they receive. This is uh, similar in, in Hungary, but you can see all of the, many countries depend a lot. And in fact, in some studies looking at at local authorities and local funding, the EU budget is practically one of the few sources of funding they have 
lately because with the financial crisis the budget got in such big trouble that practically the the, the EU funding has become absolutely crucial for investment so this this picture is is quite revealing on on actually also how influential and how not, not only how dependent these uh, countries are some of them the, the poorest region the poorest countries from this funding but actually this is has an enormous power and influence if you are actually introducing management systems of funds and rules and obligations it influences all of the methodology for public expenditure, national and EU. So this is something to take into account, is that regional policy, while a small amount of public expenditure, let's say, overall in the European Union, it is very, very influential in the poorest regions that get this funding. Now, one of the challenges that we have uh, to look at, I would like put this, there are many challenges, <laughs> but one of the challenges that has, has happened with the enlargement, with complications, with the, uh, uh, with the br uh, breadth of operations and the, the number of areas and the need to be efficient and effective and more target is that the regulatory weight uh, on this funding has increased enormously. Since the year 2000, we have here a multiplication by by three, uh, by four, sorry, uh, over four of, of the, uh, yeah, by four of the, of the pages and, and the guidelines and the regulation. We have how many regulations are there from 17 to 30, how many decisions have been uh, there and, and, op and guidelines to that, that run the implementation, commission decisions, guidelines of the commission are very powerful also. And, and this has, has increased to such a level that, in fact, some regions have problems to follow the procedures, actually to not make mistakes, uh, given the amount of, the, given the level of complication of procedures, of auditing, of control. And this would be a challenge to reduce to someone that is effective, efficient, and less cumbersome. Uh, now I would like to speak a moment on the financial instruments because they are becoming more and more important. The financial instruments are expanding. You have inside the regional policy funds that are allocated to financial instruments. These financial instruments go and, and finance operations in the financial sector. How does it do? Yeah, it supports projects that are bankable. How, how does, it, does it go? It offers guarantees or equity to financial institutions to then uh, or other intermediaries to support projects either with equity for any innovative projects setting up of businesses or loans loans for uh, small and medium enterprises so it gives a funding and this funding is really taken out the money is taken out for the for, from the structural funds to be introduced into the financial system to create leverage to attract private banking also and to uh, to finance with lending not with grants uh, businesses and bankable operations then these these, these operations uh, the loans are paid back with interests uh, this means that you can refinance and uh, continue the operations of course some of the loans will Will, will collapse, that's the idea, you take a risk, uh, something will not go well, but because these are priced, this means you don't get a loan without an interest, although it's a lower interest than if, if it was than, uh, under normal circumstances because the, the banks were risk averse, especially in some countries, uh, you still cover the operation, manage to, uh, to uh, make the, the money to refinance itself, so you have backflows returning to the, uh, to the funds, so you have here the EU funding that goes in the financial instruments it goes to the financial recipient and it flows back so the repayments and the interests uh, so these are the financial instruments that is the basic logic there are many different instruments uh, the financial instruments in the in in this period uh, have been evolving over the years financial instruments started only for small and medium enterprises really in in the 90s and and then it has uh, in, increased and increased uh, considerably into other areas and infrastructures and innovation and, 
and all of this. You using the funding from the structural funds that goes to the managing authority. The managing authority puts it in a, in a holding fund, for example, and then go to specific funds uh, in specific intermediaries. As I said it goes to financial products. Uh, and the final recipient get them paid back. And you have also, here we have the Juncker plan, which uh, is in the second phase. It was extended in 2020. Uh, these are not structural funds. They're not pre allocation not coming from the structural funds. It's uh, These are funding directly going to the budget, which finances uh, the European Fund for Strategic Investments. And there is the the, uh, the European Investment Bank also offers some funding from its own capital to back up operations in there. From one side, you would have uh, infrastructures and innovation uh, that they finance. The other one is SMEs and, and the larger companies, uh, that's called the mid-cap companies. And the leverage expected is, is that the funding will attract from the private sector and financial sector 15 times the uh, original uh, investment, the 33 uh, billion. So this is expected the whole, this guarantee, these funds uh, will, uh, will manage to raise a total investment up to 500 billion uh, in investment. By, 220. So this is a very important um, leverage mechanism to raise uh, funding and to increase the total investment. And the EAB uh, presence offers a certain guarantee to the private sector in the projects it participate, but just by being there uh, and uh, and participating. Uh, so this is uh, really yes, it's important because uh, also the poorer regions uh, are able to to ask uh, for finance money to the poorer countries. Of course, it's it's a different system, it's a different uh, financial support, but it's open to everybody and more and more uh, it, it, it's also being streamlined and, and actually being adapted to also more risky regions and specific areas uh, of the European Union. I want to give you some pointers about the next financial framework. I mean, the 2000-2001 period has been a deep a time of deep reflection and change and in fact uh, more change and reflection and now we are trying to put everything together because there was really the financial crisis followed by a migration crisis and followed by brexit and this is because i haven't put even the the, the energy uh, objectives that the, the the problem that climate change is also getting up into the the category but i even put it as a as a known crisis but this financial immigration that are all disruptive and immediate and Brexit, this has really made uh, an, an effect and, and are going to have important impacts on the budget. The budget had to be become more flexible, more efficient, to adapt to new challenges in the middle of the programming period. So now the new MFF proposals have to take this into account and, and therefore the future structural funds are being affected. It actually adds new instruments and changes further the cohesion policy. Here I want to present some key points. Here you, we have the, the 2014-2020. Here we have the, the next financial framework. We have an increase in funding on that, but we have a decrease in economic and social and territorial cohesion. This means the cohesion policy has been weakened uh, by it, and um, and this has been taken very badly by some uh, by some that we have a shift from from the cohesion to the competitiveness. Um, we have also a quite uh, another, another fall uh, that is on on the really direct payments uh, market related expenditures. The agricultural policy has been has been cut too, uh, all to beef up particularly security uh, and and external action, uh, and uh, then and also to protect. As you can see, there is there is a protection of the, the final value of uh, of the budget, which is still. Um, still keeping up to to some level to to the to the previous budget so here we have an average over the period of course if you uh, the, this is uh, lower than let's say if every year it would have been like the last year one 142 it was less at the beginning of the period but it means that there is actually no no significant cut in any way despite that the uk is leaving the new framework goes further into the integrating of all of the policies now we we have a much wider much more uh, 
solid structure that is being proposed that actually have some coherence where the EU funds and structural investments are one pillar of several pillars of support. We have something new, a reform support program that is not more support for projects but there will be uh, around 20 something billion euros that are dedicated to intervene when countries need to do reforms which are uh, structural reforms for, 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 for really uh, um, reforming the economy. So you have here uh, funding that is given like this. It is actually funding to supporting the government instead of projects like the uh, EU funds or EU structural investment funds. We have the InvestEU. The InvestEU is the combination of FC and centrally planned funding for, for the, the, the equity and debt. So it's a very important big lending facility that, that appears that covers all kinds of areas um, that are uh, at EU level of investment. Uh, we have the European Investment and Own Lending System, which they have put here, in, interestingly, inside the structure as, as part of the support to, to, to operal, overall op operations. And the European Stability Mechanism is also there. So we are, they are trying us to really link all of these uh, bubbles that we had in this picture to make them coherent more and more between all of them. Uh, so the main point is to have a stabilization function in Europe to uh, this is an extra uh, funding this uh, that is external being created so all of this together should be able to support really the the the, the investments uh, national reform priorities and, uh, and and the programs at regional so you really go uh, they're really trying to give a, a really overall strategic point to, to to the funding much more than in the past now, let me show you the developments of unemployment and GDP in the different regions of the European Union. I've put all the regions in here. We are starting here at the point they were in 2005. We're going to check how they changed on the level of unemployment, which is going up, the higher the numbers, the higher the unemployment, the lower it goes, the more the unemployment drops. So the unemployment rate is the change in unemployment rate is on this side like this, going up and down, and then the change of GDP is here. So you go back, you lose GDP, uh, you increase GDP. We are going to see what happens when the crisis hits. How do the regions behave? With the colors would tell you red is the south, black is the north, and green are the new member states from the east. Let's see what happens. So here you have seen now the, 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 the development over this period. We see how quickly the southern part, the Mediterranean part, has been shifting up and having an unemployment rate growing quite fast. While the GDP has been falling, GDP per capita. So you have really deterioration of the situation in the Mediterranean countries, quite obviously. You have a deterioration also in, in Nordic countries, let's say in the, in the central Nordic countries. So you do have economic impacts there, but you have a much lower unemployment impact on the economy. But you have here income falls, GDP per capita falls. Well, some regions improve very much, and, you can, and this is partly also due to the central periphery, where the periphery has been declining, where the center has been, uh, have been gaining strength uh, with the, the, the parts that have managed to, to develop faster. So you have also these dichotomy increasing in, inside the economies. Now the green ones, the Eastern Europeans, you see practically all of the regions improved. Some little, some more, but all of the improved and some improved very much. So, and from the point of view of employment, in most cases employment improved. So the unemployment has been falling. Just to see again the, the developments, we, we, we really see that in when the crisis is 2006, you start having this economic impact, it's affecting the regions, and then it really accelerates strongly in the southern part of the countries. And this is where the, our data analysis was stopping. And, and this is 
really affecting the thinking and uh, behind the new cohesion policy, the cohesion proposals, which are shifting the weight. Because while growth is expected to continue in the new member states, the unemployment in the southern countries show a serious structural deficiency in the economy, which is not going to be reversed easily without some kind of targeted intervention. Well, that was all on the structure funds. I hope you enjoyed the description and the explanation, and I hope it will be useful for your work. Mm -hmm.